July, guys. Well, December has roared in like a polar bear. Good Lord. <laughs> At least we're done with November. Entering the last month of 2022 into the deep freeze. It is a Thursday, December 1st. 2022. Good Lord, and I'm hiding out in my little, <laughs> what is this? Is it my haven or is it my prison here? And uh, so, you know, guys, I have gotten so deep into the bottomless well of Doomer porn that I have uh, uncovered at medium.com which will keep any Doomer uh, occupied throughout this brutal winter that I've barely come up for air to go over to the mainstream media or anything else. So I want to thank my good buddy uh, Jeremy Jimenez, who I have had the pleasure of interviewing here. Uh, Dr. Jimenez sent me this excellent piece uh, out of the Atlantic magazine and good for the Atlantic magazine for having the uh, cojones to publish this. Uh, and this is a long essay. I'm only going to read the half that, you know, appeal the, appeals to the quote doomer community out there. And I'm going to put the little dog down and he can go look for, look for those squirrelies. Uh, so this is a long essay by a fellow whose name I vaguely recognize. It's a, a writer named Adam Kirsch, K-I-R-S-C-H. And this long essay is uh, adapted from Adam Kirsch's book, the revolt against humanity. I like that. The revolt against humanity, imagining a future without us, meaning a future without humans. And this is what he does in this uh, essay. <clears throat> The people cheering for humanity's end, a disparate group of thinkers said, w say we should welcome our demise. Hallelujah. The people cheering for humanity's end. And uh, I'm going to skip over the, uh, the introduction. Uh, I will put the link on here, and if you're not paywalled out, I think you get a free article a month there. Um, I'm just, just for brevity's sake, um, I'm going to have to skip ahead to where he gets, you know, gets to the point. Um, okay, we're going to pick up, let's pick up right here. <clears throat> Even the most radical 20th century, you know, this is so 20th century, even the most radical 20th century thinkers stopped short at the prospect of the actual extinction of Homo sapiens, which would mean the end of all of our projects, values, and meanings. Humanity may be destined to disappear someday, but almost everyone, almost everyone, uh -huh, would agree that the day should be postponed as long as possible, just as most individuals generally try to delay the inevitable end of their own life. In recent years, however, a disparate group of thinkers has begun to challenge this core assumption from Silicon Valley boardrooms to rural communes to academic philosophy departments, a seemingly inconceivable idea 
is being seriously discussed that the end of humanity's reign on earth is imminent and that we should welcome it, making planet earth a human exclusion zone. Don't believe that we finally get some sun as soon as I uh, start today's Chronicle of the Collapse. <clears throat> the revolt against humanity is still new enough to appear outlandish, well, to some people, but it is already spread beyond the fringes of the intellectual world, and in the coming years and decades, it has the potential to transform politics and society in profound ways, and it also has the potential to be completely ignored, laughed at, marginalized, lampooned. Anyway, <clears throat> this view, you know, that we should make planet Earth a human exclusion zone, <clears throat> finds support among very different kinds of people, engineers and philosophers, political activists and would-be hermits, novelists and paleo paleontologists not only do they not see themselves as a single movement but in many cases they want nothing to do with one another indeed the turn against human primacy is being driven by two ways of thinking that appear to be opposites <clears throat> the first is Anthropocene anti-humanism, which is the one, of course, I aspire to. The first is Anthropocene anti-humanism, inspired by revulsion at humanity's destruction of the natural environment. The notion that we are out of tune with nature isn't new. It has been a staple of social critique since the Industrial Revolution. More than half a century ago, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, an expose on the dangers of DDT, helped inspire modern environmentalism with its warning about following, quote, the, the impetuous and heedless pace of man rather than the deliberate pace of nature, close quote. But environmentalism is a meliorous movement aimed at ensuring the long-term well-being of humanity along with other forms of life. Carson did not challenge the right of humans to use pesticides. She simply argued that, quote, the methods employed must be such that they do not destroy us along with the insects, close quote. In the 21st century, Anthropocene anti-humanism offers a much more radical response to a much deeper ecological crisis. It says that our self-destruction is now inevitable and that we should welcome it as a sentence we have justly passed on ourselves. Some anti-humanist thinkers look forward to the extinction of our species while others predict that even if some people survive the coming environmental apocalypse, civilization as a whole is doomed. Like all truly radical movements, Anthropocene anti-humanism begins not with a political program, but with a philosophical idea. I would say it, it begins with a biological uh, idea. Anyway, it is a rejection of humanity's 
traditional role as Earth's protagonist, the most important being in creation. There you go. Okay, now for the other side. Transhumanism, by contrast, glorifies some of the very things that anti-humanism decries. Scientific and technological progress, the supremacy of reason, but it believes that the only way forward for humanity is to create new forms of intelligent life that will no longer be Homo sapiens. Some transhumanists believe that genetic engineering and nanotechnology will allow us to alter our brains and bodies so profoundly that we will escape human limitations such as, you know, that boring old mortality and confinement to a physical body. Others await with hope or trepidation the invention of artificial intelligence infinitely superior to our own. These beings will demote humanity to the rank we assign to animals unless they decide that their goals are better served by wiping us out completely. The anti humanist future and the transhumanist future are opposites in most ways except for the most fundamental. They are worlds from which we have disappeared, and rightfully so. In thinking about these visions of a humanless world, it is difficult to evaluate the likelihood of them coming true. Some predictions and exhortations are so extreme that it is tempting not to take them seriously, if only as a defense mechanism. But the revolt against humanity is a real and significant phenomenon, even if it is just an idea and its predictions of a future without us never come true. After all, unfulfilled prophecies have been responsible for some of the most important movements in history, from Christianity to communism. The revolt against humanity is not yet a movement on, a, on that scale and might never be but it belongs in the same category. It is a spiritual development of the first order, a new way of making sense of the nature and purpose of human existence. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip over a couple of paragraphs just for the sake of time here. Um, and then, they, so they start talking about this group Extinction Rebellion. You, you, you know, by the, the name Extinction Rebellion, is, I've always understood it to mean they are rebelling against human extinction, that the members of Extinction Rebellion are not promoting the extinction of the human race. Uh, maybe I've uh, been underestimating them. Alright, so... Okay, in October of 2019, London erupted in civil disorder when activists associated with the group Extinction Rebellion blocked commuter trains at rush hour. At one underground station, a protester was dragged from the roof of a train and beaten by a mob. <coughs> In the following months, Extinction Rebellion members staged smaller disruptions at the International Criminal Court in The Hague, on New York's Wall Street, and at the South Australian State Parliament. <coughs> the group is nonviolent in principle, 
but it embraces aggressive tactics such as mock die-ins and mass arrests to shock the public into recognizing that the end of the human species is not just the stuff of movie nightmares. It is an imminent threat arising from anthropogenic climate change, which could render large parts of the globe uninhabitable. Roger Hallam, one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion uses terms such as extinction and genocide to, the, to describe the catastrophe he foresees, language that is far from unusual in today's environmental discourse. The journalist David Wallace Wells, you know, before he flipped uh, recently, rendered the same verdict in the uninhabited earth in 2019, marshalling evidence for the argument that climate change, quote, is not just the biggest threat human life on the planet has ever faced, but a threat of an entirely different category and scale, close quote. Since the late 1940s, humanity has lived with the knowledge that it has the power to annihilate itself at any moment through nuclear war. Indeed, the climate anxiety of our time can be, a, can be seen as a return of apocalyptic fears that went briefly into abeyance after the end of the Cold War. Destruction by despoliation is more radically unsettling. It means that humanity is endangered not only by our acknowledged vices, such as hatred and violence, <coughs> but also by pursuing aims that we ordinarily consider good and natural. Prosperity, comfort, and don't forget, increase of our kind. The Bible gives the negative commandment, thou shalt not kill, as well as the positive commandment, be fruitful and multiply and traditionally those have gone together. But if being fruitful and multiplying starts to be seen as itself a form of killing, it's the biggest form of killing uh, since the asteroids hit. Uh, that's exactly what being fruitful and multiplying is. A form of killing because it deprives future generations and other species of ir irreplaceable resources, then the flourishing of humanity can no longer be seen as simply good. Instead, it, meaning the flourishing of humanity, becomes part of a zero-sum competition that pits the gratification of human desires against the well-being of all of nature, not just animals and plants, but soil, stones, and water. If that is the case, then humanity can no longer be considered a part of creation or nature as science and religion teach in their different ways. Instead, it, meaning humanity, must be seen as an anti-natural force that is usurped and abolished nature, <clears throat> substituting its own will for the processes that once appeared to be the immutable basis of life on Earth. This understanding of humanity's place outside and against the natural order is summed up 
in the term Anthropocene, which in the past decade has become one of the most important concepts in the humanities and social sciences. The legal scholar Jedediah Purdy offers a good definition of this paradigm shift in his book, After Nature, published in 2015. Quote, the Anthropocene finds its most extreme expression in our acknowledgement that the familiar divide between people and the natural world is no longer useful or accurate because we shape everything from the upper atmosphere to the deep seas. There is no more nature that stands apart from human beings, close quote. <clears throat> we find our fingerprints in places that might seem utterly inaccessible to human beings. <clears throat> in the accumulation of plastic on the ocean floor and the thinning of the ozone layer six miles above our heads, humanity's domination of the planet is so extensive that evolution itself must be redefined. The survival of the fittest, the basic mechanism of natural selection, now means the survival of what is most useful to humans. Amen, brother. In the Anthropocene, nature becomes a reflection of humanity for the first time. The effect is catastrophic, not only in practical terms, but spiritually. Nature has long filled for secular humanity one of the roles once played by God as a source of radical otherness that can humble us and lift us out of ourselves. One of the first observers to understand the significance of this change was the writer and activist Bill McKibben in The End of Nature, written in 1998. A landmark work of environmental thought, McKibben warned of the melting, and gl melting glaciers and superstorms that are now our everyday reality, but the real subject of the book was our traditional understanding of nature as a, quote, world entirely independent of us, which was here before we arrived, and which encircled and supported our human society, close quote. This idea, McKibben wrote, was about to go extinct just like an animal or a plant. If the choice that now confronts us is between a world without nature and a world without humanity, today's most radical anti-humanist thinkers do not hesitate to choose the latter. In his 2006 book, Better Never to Have Been, the celebrated anti-natalist philosopher David Benatar argues that the disappearance of humanity would not deprive the universe of anything unique or valuable. Quote, the concern that humans will not exist at some future time is either a symptom of human arrogance or is some misplaced sentimentalism, close quote. <clears throat> Humanists, even secular ones, assume that only humans can create meaning and value in the universe. Without us, we tend to believe, without us, we tend to believe 
all kinds of things might continue to happen on earth, but they would be pointless, a show without an audience. I was just listening somewhere else in the Doomosphere just yesterday, I think. I can't remember. Somebody in the Doomosphere was talking about the absolute pointlessness of human existence. I think whoever this was defined 300, you know, human history. Uh, he summed it up uh, something I'm thinking this is a fairly direct quote that human history can be summed up as a 300,000 year reign of terror and a never ending period of senseless violence against this planet. And whoever it was in the Doomosphere who uh, said that, uh, I wish I could remember who said that. Two days ago, I was cheering the guy on. Anyway, back to uh, Mr. Benatar. Uh, for anti-humanists, however, this is just another example of the metaphysical egoism that leads us to overwhelm and destroy the planet, which is exactly what it is. Uh, getting back to anti-natalist David Benatar, quote, what is so special about a world that contains moral agents and rational deliberations that humans value a world that contains beings such as themselves says more about their inappropriate sense of self-importance than it does about the world, close quote. Rather, you know, according to Benatar and a lot of other people, rather we should take comfort in the certainty that humans will eventually disappear, quoting uh, anti-natalist Benatar, quote, things will someday be the way they should be. There will be no people, close quote. Hallelujah. So anyway, that's the uh, end of the first half. And so then uh, what Kirsch does is then he spends the second uh, half of uh, this excellent essay uh, talking about those clueless morons known as transhumanists. But I guess anybody supporting a, a life, uh, a planet, an earth without people, I guess can't be all bad as deluded as they are. So if you have any interest in reading about that, you can go on the link and read it yourself. Uh, so anyway, should I? All right, I will, uh, let's see. Anyway, I'm just going to wrap it uh, up there because I can't think of a better way to uh, close out this rant. He, uh, Kirsch comes back and ties up, he ties it all together in the end. Uh, but uh, I like, uh, where was the quote? I just read it. Things will someday be the way they should be. There will be no people. And the sooner, the better. Uh, but anyway, as long as I am a human alive on this planet, uh, looks like the sun is back out, and I might head back out to my solar-powered greenhouse to sit out there and uh, 
pretend like I'm lying on the beach in Mexico. Get out there and enjoy uh, being a human on the planet while you still can. Bye, guys. I don't know why it's...